Well, Mr. Will Swinson, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's good to see you. It couldn't be a bigger pleasure. Right? Patrick, my old buddy. I know. You and I, you and I go way back. So it's a, it's a pleasure to finally have you on the podcast and ask you all those questions that have just been eating away at me all these years. <laughs> Please. But we do go so, way back. I, I way know. Back. I know, I know. So, so I, I, I wanted to kind of, kind of start back because at, at this point you've, you've been in eight Broadway shows, but, Sounds right. but you didn't, you didn't come to New York right away, like right out of college or anything. You, you lived uh -huh. and performed elsewhere, like we did at Disney World. So, what was it that finally led you to pursue a career here in New York? Uh, my wife and I got pregnant. We discovered that we were having a baby, and we had been kind of in a touring vein for a few years. And we were like, you know what? Touring doesn't seem like the most conducive thing to being stable parents. So we moved to New York and uh, tried to put down some roots then. Now, was that, I assume that was a transition because like when we met, you were in Orlando, but you know, much different city than New York. Was it a, a transition? <laughs> yeah. yeah, big time. I mean, that was always the plan was to move to New York. I mean, I majored in, in theater and, and wanted to be a, a Broadway actor, um, but you know, Disney World was was the first uh, a big big job that came a call in, so uh, I got my equity card at, at Disney World and and got a couple of tours after that and um, and it seemed like the the right time to to head up to New York and try to try to dive into the big theater pond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now now your first show was was Brooklyn. That was your first Broadway show here in New York. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so at that point, did it feel like, okay, you wanted to get on Broadway? Did you feel like you'd made it or did it seem like maybe a stepping stone to something more? Well, yeah. I mean, I always said when I was coming up is like, if I can perform one night in one Broadway show, I, I will, I will never be ungrateful afterward. I will just like, I will be able to check that off the list and, and be thrilled. Um, and so on one hand, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, I have performed on Broadway. Even though I was a, a swing, I was a cover in a show that, that, you know, I, that wasn't really hugely on the map and I, I didn't go on a ton, but you, you change your goals immediately. The, the second you attain them, you're like, okay, well now I want this. And then the next one you're like, oh, now I want this. Um, and because it had taken so much work to get there, I moved to New York in 2000 and, and Brooklyn wasn't until 2004. So I spent four years of, of scrapping around and taking out of town stuff and, and um, like off, off Broadway stuff. Oh yeah. Um, just trying to get seen. And, and um, so I, I was, I, I wasn't um, blind to the, the challenges of, of getting work. Um, and did you Broadway. have to make a decision to stop doing the out of town stuff and just focus on in New York or were you still trying to balance both? No, I was just scrapping, trying to, trying to get, get on Broadway. Um, I, I was, you know, I had a, a baby <laughs> and, um, and, and my, my first wife and I were, were just like tag team and parenting and, and um and I was dragging this baby around town auditioning and just trying trying to get it done. I mean, there, I come from a theater family back in Utah, and the the safety net was was at the time was always like, all right, well if if Will can't make it, then we'll just go back and and take over the the family theater someday. So there was sort of that in the back of my mind was like, okay, well I can always go home and and kind of you know transition. Um, into taking over the theater as my mom wants to retire eventually. <laughs> right. <laughs> now your next Broadway show didn't last that very long. That would be Lestat. It only lasted a month on Broadway. <laughs> uh, what was that short experience life? I mean, was it a surprise that, that the show closed as early as it did? It wasn't. And it, it's, it's always funny to think of it as, as having such a short run because the, from my experience and my memory, it was like, it, it was such a, a long <laughs> process. Um, Cause there was like the rehearsals and then the out of town in San Francisco and then re-workshopping it because it wasn't working in San Francisco. And then coming back and trying to get it, trying to get it done. Um, and I think we all knew that it just wasn't great kind of from the beginning. So 
So, I so even in all these reworks and tweaks, it just never seemed to quite click. Yeah, I mean, I remember having conversations with our castmates just going, it's like watching a slow motion train wreck. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> just like, oh no, that decision seems like it's never going to work and it's costing millions of dollars and it's too late to stop it. And oh no, it doesn't work and it's bad. Mm. And it seems like it should have. I mean, it was an Elton John score and based on the Anne Rice books, which are hugely right. popular. And I, we, I think we all thought that it was just going to be a, a slam dunk, but it was not. Hmm. Now, was it tough to then show up to work, or did, or did everyone kind of keep the faith, keep believing? Okay, maybe today they're going to fix it. I mean, yeah, I think, I think we thought it could catch on because I mean, you and I both know there, are, there are shows that are not great that have had long, healthy runs on Broadway. They keep going. Yeah, yeah, there are some that really, you know structurally and musically maybe aren't aren't the best things and they and they end up catching an audience um so we thought you know maybe it was an elton john musical we were just you know and the, i think he's written four or five and this was the, this is the only one that hasn't been a massive success right um and our cast was hugely talented incredible voices and performances so yeah i think we thought that that it, it could take off and you know everyone wants their show to do well so we definitely gave it gave it a college try <laughs> and and I'm curious, having not been in a Broadway show that failed or succeeded, once you're done with a, a short show like Lestat, everyone kind of knows, all right, well, that didn't work. Does that in any way affect either you auditioning as you go out or how people see you? I'm curious about that. I don't know. You know, I I, I don't know that there's ever too much judgment on the actors of a production that fail. Um like, I feel like you can go to the worst show on Broadway ever and still be like, oh my God, those people are insanely talented. Like the talent is always good. Right. There's so much talent that I, I don't, I can't think of a show where I was like, well, that show failed because the performances were terrible. <laughs> so I think like in the industry, maybe like we're lucky in that the blame doesn't get put on us. And generally if something doesn't work, it's much more, you know, for other factors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. True. And that, now, now your next show was one of those 110 in the shade. It certainly did very, very well. It was received well. And that's also where you would end up meeting your future wife, Audrey McDonald. Was mm -hmm. there a connection right off the bat? Was it a slow process? How did that work? Um, it was super slow. Um, we had kids the same age. Um, so we started doing play dates with our kids and our kids got along really well. And, uh, we were both married. Um, so at, at first we, we didn't, uh, you know, clock that, that there was something going on there, but you know, we were also in struggling marriages. Um, and then, you know, way down the line, um, when our kids continued to get along and, and I started going on, I was an understudy for the, for the lead role. And, and so when I got to go on, we had some, some fun chemistry on stage and, um, and things kind of, uh, bubbled from there. Right. It kind of laid the groundwork for what would come in the future. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, now during these first three shows, um, you were also doing films and, and kind of once you moved to New York, you were doing films with LDS or, or the Mormon church. <laughs> how important has your, your faith, that, that church life that you grew up with, how important has that been to you in your life and career? It's been, um, Wonderful and challenging at the same time. I, I no longer go to church. I'm not a, not a practicing Mormon anymore. That said, you know when you grow up Mormon, it's it's kind of the the foundation of of your being. You know your entire mm -hmm. culture is based around the church and um, a lot of expectation and a lot of uh, I don't know. I guess just the whole structure of your of your world is kind of based in the church. So there's no getting around like the fact that I I I am. Mormon in much that, you know, like if you were Jewish and you don't go to church anymore, you'd say I'm Jewish. So like, you know, I'm, I'm still very much culturally Mormon. Uh, yeah, I, because I, I don't know if it's the same for you. I grew up in the Presbyterian church. And even though I'm not regularly attending that church anymore, the, the, the principles, kind of the, the way of life that it was ingrained in me, that foundation as I was growing up is still with me today. I may have departed here and there from this and that, but that core foundation is still kind of there in how I see the world. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. I miss, uh, you know, elements of it. And, um, and, you know, it's a tricky, um, thing to extricate yourself from, um, you know, 
I think I think there's there's the fear of judgment from from close friends and family who think that you've you know gone morally astray if you no longer believe the way that they do. Um, and that that's challenging. Uh, you know, I come from a theater family, so I think on on one hand uh, they're proud of their their son of Utah that 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 has done well and succeeded, and on the other hand, um, I think they're probably you know, praying for me. And, <laughs> and, and frankly, they, I think they're, they're sad and disappointed and, and, and probably think that I have something wrong with my, my soul that I haven't uh, stayed in the church. And that's sad. Were those films like some of your last connection with the church? Well, the films honestly weren't produced by the church itself. There was just right. this kind of era of, of making uh, Mormon centered uh, material kind of about Mormons for Mormons, but kind of, you know, they were like John Hughes movies for Mormons, um, <laughs> but, you know, super, lots of inside jokes and, and, um, and they did really well. There's a huge Mormon population in the world and, and everyone wants to see themselves represented on, on screen. So these were just kind of the first of their kind and, and they, they did really well. And, and because I was the star of the very first one, uh, I think I was sort of recognizable. So I, I made a string of them. And they were they were great. They 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 they're they're cute little films, and 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 I learned a ton about filmmaking, um, to the degree that I made my own one of them, uh, wrote and directed one years after we started doing those. Yeah, it must have laid different groundwork. I know for me, the commercials were kind of that getting on camera experience and learning just where to go, what to do, what these things mean as you're directed. Yeah, right, all that technical craziness that, that goes into working in that medium. It's, it's such a different animal from, from the theater. Yeah. You've certainly done at this point, more credits with, uh, when it comes to TV film than you have on Broadway, would you say that you're now just as adept either way, or do you still feel at home and one more than the other? Uh, much more on stage. Um, having grown up on stage, I just, that's, that's my home and that's my, my first love. Um, I, I, I'm learning the craft of, of TV, particularly the last few years. Um, I've, <laughs> out of necessity, since we haven't had the theater, <laughs> right. um, I've been working um, kind of exclusively in, in film and TV for the last uh, couple of years. So I just feel like that's, it's, that, that skill is so unique and, and it's just technical. There's just so much to learn about how things get made and, and how, to, how to sort of clock the, the right ways to um to be i mean God, it's it's a conversation that's like three other podcasts for you but yeah, but exactly. but um it's it's incredible I, I, i've said before it's like math for actors <laughs> just like you yeah know. yeah because there's there's so much technical yes you yeah. still need to be talented and artistic but there's so much technical blocking and choreography and where to put your hand and do this and make sure yeah. you're looking here but don't yeah. talk loud enough but soft enough. It, right it's the ultimate multitaskers uh um medium just like if you can, you know, hit your mark and, and ignore this camera and this dude with the light right here and make sure that you remember to touch this on this line every single time and then look here on that time, but not there, but there. And it's a piece of tape on the camera you're looking at, not an actual actor. If you can do all that and still somehow drop into the dramatic moment that you're supposed to be portraying, then right. you're an amazing camera actor. But it's just it's a it's a challenge and it's a long list of things to learn to try to get it right. Well, going back to theater then. Would you say that hair was a defining moment in your career, particularly on stage on Broadway? For sure, absolutely. That was um, my big break, far and away. That was that was the moment that things started to to finally roll. Like I had, I had done three Broadway shows before that, but I was understudying in all of them. And uh, like well, like we were saying, my you know you you, you change your goals. You know, I got my first one and I was like, okay, well now I want to just be in the show. And so then in Lestat, I was in the show, but I was understudying for the leads and, and then uh, 110 in the shade, the same story. And finally, uh, at the end of 110, I told my agent, I was like, I really, I don't want to understudy for my whole career. And I don't want to get known as a swing of somebody that can just come in and, and cover three or four roles. Well, um, I really want to be uh, a leading man. So I, I stopped auditioning for, for ensemble roles, which was a I assume massive that was, yeah, big tough leap decision of faith. there. Yeah. Yeah. And hair didn't even, it, it wasn't like hair was, was going to be a Broadway show when I auditioned for it. It was just going to be a concert. It was going to be a three night concert at the, at the Delacorte for the public theater. 
and I wasn't even going to get the lead at first. Um, they were going to, they offered it. I'm sure I know they did. And to some, I don't know who it is to this day, but they offered it to some other, you know, probably uh, recognizable name who turned it down. And then I was the, all right, well, let's give it to Will. Um, so I just did the concert and then that re went really well. And they decided to bring it back to the Delacorte for one of their two summer shows the next summer. And then that went really well. And so then they, then it went to Broadway. So it wasn't even like I auditioned for a Broadway show and, and got the lead. It was, it was just one of the, you know, irons in the fire that, that, uh, that took off. Thank goodness. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause you, you got to, cause Gavin Creel was with that from the concert all the way through the Broadway no, show, correct? Actually not true. Um, the concert first was, um, Jonathan Groff was, that's with, right. That's right. In yeah. the concert and in the park, he was, he was, uh, for most of it. And then he had to go shoot a movie as one does when you're Jonathan Groff. <laughs> um, and then Chris Hankey came in and played Claude for the rest of the summer and he was awesome. And then on Broadway, it was Gavin. So you were kind of the, <laughs> the anchor and all these other guys are coming in around you. A little bit because, uh, Karen Olivo was actually our first Sheila. And then Karen Manuel was was for the run in the park, and then uh, and then Casey Levy played played Sheila on Broadway. So I guess of the three of us, I, I was the only one that that stuck around for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> was that just you saying, "Hey, I'll keep doing it"? Or what, oh, was I was there... desperate to keep doing it. I was like, "This right. is an amazing part and an amazing show." It's just other people had other other stuff to do. Karen uh, Olivo, you know, went to do West Side Story and won a Tony Award, and I, I was like, "Karen, you're nuts." hair is going to be the biggest thing in the world. She's like, I'm going to go win a Tony. Shut up, Will. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Tony, you got a nomination for hair. Now, Yay! did it, did it feel like, Hey, I'm giving a Tony award winning performance or was it a surprise? <laughs> no, no I'm, I mean, you know, that there is a sense of confidence that we have as actors and we know if we're doing a good job. I, it's impossible to answer that question. I, I, I have this mental block with the, the award stuff. Like, I hate it. I hate it so much. The minute that like a show is successful, there are just a thousand voices that get in your ear and they're just like, you're going to win it, Tony. This is amazing. You're so talented. And, and there's, it just gets in your head. And it, it, it's like this other entity in the room that for my money, I just do not like, I wish, I wish they didn't exist. And simultaneously, I would love to win a Tony award. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's frustrating because you just want to do the show and you just want to like, be in it as deeply as you can. And, and the minute that, that the award seasons come around, there's just this other voice in the room that's like challenging you to do well and, and you want to show all your best stuff. And, you know, there's Tony voters out there. So everybody's giving it a little more than normal. And it's just, oh, I hate that. I hate that it's mm. not just just as pure as as it could be. That sounds a little cheesy, but but no no no. But but it sounds like you feel a different energy from a cast that knows they're up for an award. They're the show is nominated, or the individual performances are nominated. It just something happens to the show. Is what? Yeah, I mean, our 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 art form is is so much of it is about headspace, and and when there's something else rattling around in that same headspace that that isn't at its core part of the part of the story. It, it, it's it's a detractor and so I, I i wish that that award season didn't exist and I, if it did i wish it was just like a lovely dinner with all of your peers and, and <laughs> you know and someone shouts out from the pulpit and just says you guys were awesome and you guys were awesome congratulations instead of it turning into this competitive thing i mean the last thing you want to do as an actor is feel competition with, with right. somebody I feel like you else. need to beat another actor exactly right. like are you kidding me the year that I was nominated, my, my fellow nominees, I was just like in awe of all of them, people that I grew up just going, are you kidding me? That's who I aspire to be. How, how could I possibly feel like I want to be in competition with these folks? Now, certainly your wife knows a few things about the Tony Awards. <laughs> how, how do you think that your views on the Tony Awards differ? I mean, obviously she, she's won and been nominated many times. Has, yeah. Is there a little bit of uh, perspective that she gives you? I mean, she's in that luxurious position of, of, of saying they don't mean anything. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> cause she yeah, has okay. so many. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't mean anything until you get one and then you're much more castable and you can ask for a lot more money. Right. Um, I mean, they, they mean, they can mean a lot to the trajectory of a career or how you're seen or how you're marketed, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I know what she means when she says they don't mean anything because they shouldn't mean anything. 
um, it's that's another long whole podcast is to talk about um, <laughs> how to deal with with a, a incredibly talented partner in the business when you're um, on an, on a different level. That's that's a podcast I would listen to <laughs> over and over. And I have a lot of couple friends who are like one of them is very successful and the other is is you know um, a different not as successful. successful, a different kind of successful, and 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 the challenges and insecurities that go along with that. Um, but for the most part, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a sexy problem to have, uh, you know, oh, poor me, I have to deal with my, my, the, the mentality of my incredibly successful wife and, and, um, and, you know, 90% of, of any, any, um, discussion that we have, I come out the, the luckier for her insight and her expertise. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you, you've both been in the business about the same time, correct? Um, I mean, as far as professionally, she, she blew up so, so dang early. I mean, she, she graduated from Juilliard and like, you know, got carousel immediately. And I, that was in like, oh, what was that? Like 96, I want to say. Yeah. That was like mid nineties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think so. When you and I were, were landing at, at Disney world, I think she was winning her first Tony award. So yes. Yeah. That, that's, so, I mean, I as far as getting our equity cards at the same time, maybe <laughs> we got the same, <laughs> we've been in the same amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. On a little different track. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's one of the. It's both a beautiful thing, but also can be a frustrating thing when people are on different tracks. I mean, take you and I for example. You know, we're we came along Disney World around the same time, and and you showed up at New York a little bit before me, but there's been a similar trajectory. However, compared to me, you are the more successful one. You have achieved things that I'm still waiting on. And so th there is beauty in the fact that we can all make it in different ways in this career, mm -hmm. but frustrating when looking at other people who uh -huh. are what you aspire to be, you know, like the, the people that were also nominated with you when you were nominated for a Tony. It, 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 how do you deal with that kind of frustration of seeing others who are doing what you want to do? Well, I'll tell you what, and it's taken me a long time to get to this point, and I, I hopefully I'm still getting to this point, but I... In life, I feel like the things that I value the most are the things that I've had to work the hardest at. And I am super grateful for, for the, the challenges that I faced getting to this point. I think if I had landed in New York and like, you know, hit the ground running and, and was massively successful right off the bat, I don't think I'd value it as much. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful for the scrapping that I've had to do. And I think it's made my, my, if you want to call it success, um, feel a little sweeter um, in that uh, it's it's taken taken a long time to get here, and as as I know is the case with you as well. When your personal life is this other sort of uh, beast to wrangle at the same time, sometimes you just gotta you know give your energy to that and and try to try to. <laughs> stay afloat in life and your aspirations for a successful acting career, you know, you have to press pause on that in order to, to get a hold of yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our lives have both taken some pretty crazy left turns that we maybe didn't foresee when we, when we started right. out. Yeah. And, uh, and if we had, um, you know, made it all about the business and nothing but the business, we probably, wouldn't be here. <laughs> we, we probably would have had to make uh, other life choices that that wouldn't have led us to where we are. And and I don't think I would be as as. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm well adjusted, but I don't think I'd be as well adjusted. <laughs> we we all hope that we're getting there. <laughs> but hope, hopefully, you you choose your sanity and and your happiness um, first when it, when it comes to the the trajectory of how you you navigate this. Yeah, this life yeah. and not just the business. Yeah, because we've we've both been married before, and it was actually during our first marriages that you and I met and got to know each other in Orlando while at Disney World, and and I remember the the struggles that I went through after my marriage ended. It took me a while to kind of adjust to that new chapter in my life, and mm -hmm. you know, and and as you said, it affected me both personally as well as professionally. What was it that helped you through that tough transition, kind of back to single life again? Man, that's a big question. Um, I mean, the the big answer is is Audra helped me. Um, 
But at the same time, I had to figure out who I was. It felt like from scratch when I, when I left the church and, and got divorced. You know, like I said earlier, you, 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 growing up in the Mormon church, it's just, it's, it's everything about who you are. And, um, and so, so stepping away from that was, you know, it was a years long process of getting the strength to kind of say, you know what, this, this doesn't work for me. And I, I just, I don't, I, I can't, I can't make it true. I've tried my whole life and I just, I, I, it, I can't make it true anymore. And I've, I've tried every single thing that I can do. Um, did it feel like you were letting yourself down in some way? Absolutely. You know, and, and I felt like there was something wrong with me, um, you know, morally and, 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 you know, I tried to, and I've always tried to live the best life that I can. I'm far from perfect. And, you know, and I, and it would force me to like focus on my shortcomings as a person and just, just beat myself up to no end. Um, and it was detrimental to my, to my confidence in my soul just kind of feeling like I was this terrible unworthy person because I couldn't make this church true for myself. I know that for myself when my marriage ended I know I lost a part of myself and I know that there was a a part of me that I either didn't know or had just had to change because I was now I'm now in a different place in my life. Mm -hmm. So I know for me there was just a part of me that got cut off some of my own doing, some of her doing, some of just the, the, the way that it happened. And it, it took me years, to, as you said, to rediscover, to figure out, wait, well, what, what am I doing? How, how do I get myself back? Absolutely. You know, finally, after literally more than a decade of just praying as hard as I could and trying to make it work and that having its ramifications on my relationship, um, being massively challenging. I, I was like, I've tried every single thing that I could other than, than stepping away. So I did that. And that was, you know, also a long, long process. Um, and a gut wrenching, wrenching process. And, and because, you know, it's, it's everything that you've known and believed in, it, it felt very much like a, like a re, uh, a rebirth of, of like creating a, a person, <laughs> a new person. I mean, when I, when I look back on my life, it seems like, you know, there's, there's, that will and then there's this other this other life um so to answer your question um it it took soul searching it just took it just took like uh it it feels like courage to to let to you know to let my family down in quotation marks and and leave the church and and uh it, it broke my family's heart and still does, I think. Um, the, the vast, vast majority of my family are still very, very fervent in the church. And, um, and it's continued to, you know, be a point of friction for, to this day. It's hard to, to walk around, you know, feeling like you've let your family down. Um, you know, to that end, to be fair, my, my family are, are incredibly lovely. And I, I, you know, I've been very lucky. I've had other Mormon friends who have left the church and, and have had much trickier, more devastating uh, reactions from their families. Um, so at any rate, um, there's, there was this sort of just have to, having to sort of rediscover who I was and what, what, I, what I, yeah, you know, literally at, at age around 30s when I started to leave the church a little before that, I was, just, I was having to ask myself questions like, what do I believe in? Do I believe, do I believe in God? Do I believe, because I feel like I've been sort of spoon fed all of this my whole life. And, and, um, and it's very much a culture of, of believing like everybody else believes. And, and, you know, sure, I believe that because everyone around me believes that. Sure, grandma and grandpa believe that. So I do too, um, you know, and, and you sort of live on this borrowed light growing up and to, to step away from that and go, oh, I don't. I don't have any light of my own at this moment. Where's my light? It was challenging. And, and so the challenge was to continue to find um, and try to find um, spirituality and structure and, and, and a moral center without the structure of, of the church to, to spoon feed that to me and raise kids, you know, who are good people and, and, and teach them the same beautiful, you know, precepts of, of, of morality and, and, and goodness that, that I was taught growing up in the church. So it, it was, uh, it was a, a whole process of, of sort of recreating myself, 
but I don't think it's a coincidence that at the moment that I took that leap um, and started to discover my true, what I want to say, of my true light, um, my career took off at the exact same moment. Um, because I feel like our medium is, is like our biggest currency is authenticity. And if you can be the most authentic, most true version of your role yourself, if you can bring as much honesty as you possibly can to your, to your performance, if what you, if you, what you're showing is as close to truth as you possibly can, that's undeniable. And so I feel like there was a veil over my performance and my world um, for a long time. And I feel like once I had to ask myself the hard questions of who I really was and what I believed and was able to sort of, you know, emerge from the cocoon, so to speak, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that my, my work started to, to take off.